Before I get started on the Langlands program and the fundamental lemma, I'd like to give a bit of an extended thanks to MSRI. Um, it was uh, about 28 years ago that Kaplansky gave me a call uh, asking me to come out uh, for the year 1986-87. I told him no, I had a job, but uh, he was very persistent, and uh, I ended up coming. Um, it was a program in number theory, and uh, as you see, there was an interest in automorphic forms at the time, there was an interest in representations of uh, Galois groups, and so now I'm glad to be back at another program where uh, well, geometric representation, and then there's another side program that's interested in automorphic forms and representations of Galois groups. Uh, here are just a few of the lectures that I went to. These are all the first month, but Faltings, uh, Dick Gross, uh, Noel Melkes was a graduate student. He gave a talk on his work. Zagier, Vigneras, uh, Kasson, Tunnel, Gross, Ekman, N.E.R., Ribbit. Uh, Ribbit. Uh, if you think back to 1986, uh, this was when there was a lot of excitement about possible connections between uh, the Taniyama Shimura conjecture and uh, the proof of uh, Fermat's last theorem. And it was during the summer of 1986 that Ribbit had the idea that, there, uh, that he could uh, make this connection precise. And it was here at MSRI that he. Uh, gave a series of lectures where he thought through the details of this and uh, it was uh, a lot of interaction with, with the other members of the institute and uh, by the end of the year he had uh, a 50 page draft of this famous result that uh, linked uh, um, Taniyama to Fermat's last theorem. Uh, there was a workshop, uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Serre and Ribbit spoke uh, side by side uh, Sarah was the person to convince about this result. Uh, Andrew Wiles came out here uh, to MSRI about this time, and I don't know exactly the, the, the exact history of things, but this was just about the time that Andrew Wiles disappeared for several years uh, and uh, then reemerged with the proof of, of Fermat. So this was a very significant year in my own uh, personal development, personal career, and I'd just like to thank MSRI for this uh, chance to come back for another semester uh, in representation theory. Uh, so here are just a few of the speakers that year. Uh, uh, Milne gave a beautiful series of lectures on, uh, on the work of uh, uh, Langlands and Rapoport on Schmore varieties. Uh, Prasad gave a very nice series of lectures on uh, Bruhatit's theory in buildings. Uh, so now let me turn to today's talk. Uh, this is just uh, the rough outline of uh, the three talks that I will be giving. Uh, today will be about uh, an introduction to the Langlands program and the trace formula. Uh, this will largely be concerned with fields in characteristic zero. Um, the program uh, this fall is in geometric representation theory. This will be a little bit of analytic representation theory, but as we'll see tomorrow, this is very closely tied to the geometry, and I just want to give a little bit of background here first today about uh, some of this analytic background uh, to, so that we can appreciate more the, the geometry that, that comes later on. Uh, so tomorrow, I'll give uh, a brief overview of uh, the fundamental lemma. This is based on um, uh, the work of No Bao Cho uh, that uh, was a famous unsolved uh, conjecture for many years, and it uses the, the geometry of the Hitchin vibration to give a proof of uh, this fundamental result in representation theory. Um, and then uh, in my talk on Thursday, uh, it's going to be uh, a mixture between characteristic zero and positive characteristic. Uh, it will be a little bit uh, uh, using tools of logic and motivic integration uh, to move uh, results that we learn from geometric representation back uh, into number theory and uh, 
uh, fields of characteristic zero. Uh, so today uh, I'm going to start with uh, a little bit of background about the uh, trace formula, uh, motivation and examples. Uh, I was asked to uh, make these uh, talks uh, elementary and accessible to a large audience. I'll do my best to do so, but uh, I'll just warn you that this is a very complicated uh, field of mathematics, and uh, so I'll do my best, but I, I'm not sure I will completely succeed. Uh, as an application, just to see the type of thing that you can do with the, the trace formula, I'll describe a result uh, going back to 1988 by Kotwitz, uh, giving a calculation of Tamagawa numbers using the trace formula. Uh, then I'll mention a couple of local results, local Langlands uh, conjecture, now a theorem for GLN, and I'll also mention the case of uh, the representations of the symplectic group. And then uh, in preparation for my talk tomorrow, I'll start a little bit on the Langlands dual and an introduction to endoscopy. So let's get started. Uh, I want to just take the very simplest situation to start out with. And so I'm going to start with just a finite group. And uh, whenever we have a finite group, we can take the vector space of all the complex valued functions on that group. And uh, that has uh, subvector space of all the class functions. So the class functions are the functions on the group that depend only on the conjugacy class of the element. And uh, this vector space has uh, two standard bases. Uh, the first, well, these are functions that depend only on the conjugacy class. And so if you take the characteristic functions of the conjugacy classes, then those are uh, linearly independent functions and they span uh, this vector space. And so you get a basis of uh, this finite dimensional vector space. So in particular, the dimension of this vector space is just equal to the number of conjugacy classes in the group. Uh, but there's a second basis for this same vector space that comes from the irreducible characters. So if you take uh, irreducible uh, representations of this finite group, uh, then, well, whenever you take a trace of a matrix, it only depends on the conjugacy class of that matrix. If you take a trace of A inverse B times A, it's the trace of B. And so in particular, for any irreducible representation, uh, you get a class function just by taking the character, the trace of those matrices. And then it's a theorem that that's also a basis for this vector space of class functions. So in particular, the number of irreducible representations up to equivalence is equal to the number of conjugacy classes in the group. So if we take any class function, whatever, uh, we can expand it in terms of those two different bases. And we get an identity uh, expressing this class function H first as a sum of the characteristic functions of conjugacy classes, and secondly, as a linear combination of the irreducible characters of the group. So this is the prototype for what I mean by a trace formula. Uh, we have um, the traces on the right, and we have uh, conjugacy classes on the left, and the trace formula is an identity that says that the sum of, uh, on the one side is equal to the sum on the other. Um, so in particular, if H is the character of a representation, that will be uh, a class function. And the right-hand side will give the decomposition of that representation into re irreducibles. And these numbers m sub pi will be the multiplicities of, in which, uh, of each of the different irreducible representations. And the left-hand side, this is telling us how the representation breaks up into characters. So this would be an explicit formula for the character. These coefficients of the, characteristic, uh, of the conjugacy classes are giving the value of the character on the different conjugacy classes. Okay, so... Uh, 
Things are going to become much more difficult than this, but that uh, gives you just a, a basic uh, picture of what we want a trace formula to look like. Uh, so the left-hand side of this equation is generally called the geometric side of the trace formula, and the right-hand side is called the spectral side of the trace formula. So a trace formula is an identity between the geometric side and the spectral side of the trace formula. Uh, now to make things just a little more complicated, uh, we're going to translate this identity of, so class functions or functions on the group. We're going to make this an identity of distributions instead of uh, functions. So any function can be considered as a distribution, just integration against that um, function. Now, since I'm talking about finite groups, instead of integrals, we're just going to have finite sum. I've written a DG here in the notation just because in a few moments these are going to become integrals. But for now, uh, any function phi can be considered as a distribution. So it will take a function and, well, here I've written uh, my test function that I'm integrating against as a complex a smooth, complexly supported function on the group G. But since G is a finite group, I just mean any function on the group at this point. But in a few minutes, this is going to become actual uh, compactly supported um, smooth functions. And then uh, this is, we have a little abuse of notation here because I write phi both for the function and for the distribution. So. Uh, when I apply it to an element G in the group, I'm thinking of it as a function. And when I apply it to a test function, F, then I'm thinking of it as a distribution. I'm using the same letter phi for both. So I hope that doesn't confuse, but that's the standard notation here as we use uh, same notation. Uh, and so then this character identity again becomes a trace formula. It's written identically to what I've written before. Uh, but now both sides are no longer functions, but they're distributions on the group. So they take test functions and, and return a value. Okay, so that's uh, what we now think of as a, a trace formula. Uh, <clears throat> so let's be a little more specific about a conjugacy class when we view this as a distribution. The uh, characteristic function uh, when I sum against that, uh, all of the terms go away except for the uh, elements in the conjugacy class, and it just then becomes a sum over the elements in the conjugacy class. A conjugacy class is an orbit of the group under conjugation, and uh, the stabilizer of an element uh, gives an identification of the conjugacy class with the group modulo the centralizer of the element. And so I can write uh, this uh, consciousy class, viewed as a distribution, as a sum over the conjugates of a given element in the group. And in a moment, I'm going to replace this sum by an integral, and this integral is called an orbital integral. It's the uh, uh, integral over an orbit, where we think of the orbit as a consciousy class. Okay. So uh, this is what we want to gener generalize. So now I'm going to turn to my second example of a trace formula. Uh, this will be the Poisson summation formula. Uh, so here we're now moving away from finite groups to infinite groups. So I'm going to take a lattice inside Rn. Um, so just a free Z module of rank N. And then any lattice has a dual lattice. Uh, that consists of uh, the elements in Rn whose uh, inner product with any element in the first, every element in the first lattice is in Z. So I have a lattice and a dual lattice. Uh, and then I can take the Fourier transform of uh, a test function. And uh, I've put a, couple, a few assumptions that I'm going to have on the uh, function below. Uh, but notice that uh, we're taking a representation of the group Rn. That's e to the 2 pi i and then dot product with uh, y. That's a one-dimensional representation of this group. And when I have a representation, 
Uh, I can view this as a distribution in the same way that I did with finite groups. And that means that I want to take a test function f and integrate it against the, the character of the representation. Well, for a one-dimensional representation, the character is the same as the representation itself. And so this Fourier transform is just what I was uh, calling the, the distribution character before. So the Fourier transform is a special case of what we will be talking about. And uh, so I'll just uh, now take a test function. Uh, just uh, I've got a few uh, convergence uh, properties that I need for the Poisson summation formula. And then the Poisson summation formula uh, says that under these uh, uh, convergence condition on the test function f, uh, the sum over, of the function over all the elements in the lattice times the, the co-volume of the lattice is equal to the sum of the Fourier transform of the function over the dual lattice. So uh, as I just explained, the right-hand side can be interpreted in terms of the irreducible representations, the, the exponentials of the real group. And so this, the right-hand side is a spectral side of a trace formula, quite literally. Uh, here, the representations are all one-dimensional, but uh, it is the spectral side of a trace formula. And the left-hand side, quite literally, is the geometric side of a trace formula. Here, a conjugacy class, well, we're talking about conjugacy classes in an abelian group, uh, Rn. And so the conjugacy classes reduce to singletons. And so uh, it doesn't look like we're summing over orbital integrals, but each... <laughs> But these are orbital integrals on the left-hand side because each orbit is a singleton. And so I'm just, uh, the sum over the elements in the conjugacy class is just the, the element itself. So this is, uh, in a very real sense, uh, the same formula that we had before for a finite group, but now just applied uh, for an infinite abelian group. And so uh, the trace formula in general we should think of as a non-abelian Poisson summation formula. So we expect it to have a left-hand side that's a geometric side, right-hand side, it's a spectral side, and the equality of the sums between the two sides is our trace formula. Okay, so let's uh, go on to our third example of a trace formula. This is now the Selberg trace formula for compact quotients. So here I'm going to take uh, uh, a compact unimodular topological group G. Uh, so in terms of the last example, we can think of G as just uh, Rn. And then I'm going to fix a discrete subgroup of that uh, group. Uh, so in terms of the last example, the gamma is the same as the lattice lambda that I was using. What's unimodular? Uh, it just means that uh, left and the right harm measures are the same. Um, and so now I'm going to uh, take all square integral functions. Uh, so I'm assuming that uh, this uh, discrete subgroup is co-compact. And I'm going to take the action of the group G by right translation on this. And this gives a representation of the group on this vector space of square integral functions. And so we may view the trace of this representation. I call this representation R. The trace of this representation I can view as a distribution. And this will be like a class function. So in this context, we usually call them invariant distributions rather than class functions. But the trace formula will now be an expansion of this uh, uh, distribution in, two di in terms of two different bases, if you want. It will expand it two different ways. One in terms of the orbital integrals on the group, and the other in terms of the, um, the spectral side, the, the irreducible representation. I see I have a typo here. I've written trace of f that should be, I, I should put a pi here, trace of pi f uh, here in this slide. Uh, but if we look at this, it's the same sort of identity that we had for the Poisson summation formula, the same sort of identity that we had for the um, uh, finite group case. 
But now I've just replaced the sums by integrals. We're taking integrals over conjugacy classes uh, with respect to invariant measures on these orbits. And uh, the uh, decomposition now, the sum on the right-hand side, the spectral side, is in terms of irreducible representations of the group that appear in the L2 decomposition of this quotient space G mod gamma. So this is the Soberg trace formula. Um, so now, uh, let me turn. So the final example of a trace formula is going to be the general trace formula, the Arthur Selberg trace formula, that is really much more complicated than um, the uh, trace formulas that I've explained so far. Uh, so the context of this trace formula is going to be, we're going to fix a reductive group G, but before I do that, we're going to take a number field F. So this is just a finite extension of the, the rational numbers. And uh, for every number field, there's a, a topological ring called the ring of Adele's. And so this is a to locally compact topological ring and it's defined to be a restricted product. Uh, so uh, V runs over all places. So uh, if you have a number field, you can take all the different multiplicative norms on that number field. And just like with the rational numbers, uh, you can take the ordinary absolute value and complete with respect to the absolute value to get the real numbers. Uh, for any number field, you can do the same thing for any multiplicative norm, and you can complete with respect uh, to these different norms, and you get various locally compact fields uh, for the completions. Uh, so some of these will be familiar fields like the real numbers or the complex no numbers, but you also have no norms that are based on uh, different primes, and you get uh, the piatic uh, completions of these fields. And if you take the restricted product over all of these different possible completions, uh, you get something, uh, you need to take a, a, there's a, there's a condition that makes it a restricted product. You don't take all possible elements in the product, just those that are integers almost everywhere. And uh, you can put a topology on this ring and you get a locally compact ring. Um, and uh, so you should, uh, so these places, they're classified, these completions are classified as either Archimedean or non-Archimedean. The Archimedean property is uh, that if you take any integer and multiples of that, eventually you can get as big as you want. Uh, so if the integers stay bounded with respect to this norm, then you say it's non-Archimedean. It doesn't satisfy Archimedes' property. But if the uh, multiples, of, if the integers become unbounded, then you say that it's Archimedean. Uh, so, um, so it's a fact that, uh, well, this number field embeds into the Adele's uh, diagonally. It embeds into each completion, and so it embeds into the product of all of these completions. And this is a discrete subgroup, and the quotient is compact. And so we could do a Poisson summation type trace formula for this situation where we have uh, uh, a discrete subgroup of uh, another locally compact group. And this is what Tate does, for instance, in his thesis. But I'm not going to pursue that here. Uh, but I am going to use the Adele's. But now I'm going to use them in connection with a connected reductive group. So a connected reductive group is something like GLN or the symplectic group or the orthogonal group or unitary groups. Uh, and I can take uh, these different groups over a number field. And then uh, the group of elements in the field is a discrete subgroup of the group with coefficients in the ring of Adele's. And so this is the pair of groups that I'm going to use for the trace formula uh, that was obtained by Arthur and Selberg. Uh, this is, uh, now we look at the L2 functions of the group with coefficients in the Adele's. Uh, 
and mod out by the group with coefficients uh, in this discrete subgroup uh, coefficients in the number field. And just to make it so it has finite volume, I'll also uh, mod out by the, the center of the uh, group with coefficients in the adult. So the Arthur Selberg trace formula is now similar to the Selberg trace formula that I showed you for the compact quotient. It will expand out uh, with a spectral side and a geometric side. Um, and uh, the spectral side will again have uh, irreducible representations that appear in this uh, L2 space. And the uh, geometric side will contain the conjugacy classes, the uh, uh, viewed as distribution, so integrals over uh, uh, conjugacy classes in the group. Uh, and the only difference is that uh, in the case of compact quotients, Poisson summation, that was the entire trace formula. But now when uh, we do it in this situation where the quotient has finite so this quotient has finite volume, but it's not compact. There will be more terms in addition to just the, uh, these primary terms of sums over uh, traces of representations and orbital integrals. There will be other terms as well. And um, generally, uh, when people put these up on the board, they just write dot, dot, dot uh, for these other terms. Um, my uh, first year as a graduate student, was there was a special program going on at the Institute for Advanced Study on the trace formula. Uh, they would write formulas for the trace formula that would fill every board <laughs> uh, when you expand out the dot, dot, dots. I mean, it, it, these formulas uh, really become much more complicated than um, just... Uh, orbital integrals on one side and uh, characters on the other. But still, conceptually, uh, we think of it uh, in the same sort of way as uh, the, the geometric side and the spectral side. Uh, so let me just, uh, yes? What are the names of some of these objects that actually are the results of the... Uh, so, uh, for instance, on the... Uh, um, Geometric side, weighted orbital integrals. Um, uh, so they, they still have similar names, but uh, <laughs> a little more difficult to define. Um, OK, so let me give an, an application. Uh, this is Tamagawa numbers. Um, so this goes back to a Bourbaki seminar talk that Vey gave in 1959. Uh, let F be a number field. Uh, now, instead of taking a general reductive group, I'm going to assume that G is semi-simple and simply connected. So something like the special linear group or the symplectic group or a spin group. Um, this actually carries uh, this quotient, GF, uh, uh, G of the Adele's mod, G of the uh, uh, number field, carries a canonical measure. You can fix an invariant differential form of top degree, and it uh, over the uh, number field F, and by the product formula, you get a measure that's actually independent of the, the actual scalar that you used to, in the differential form. And so these uh, quotients carry a canonical volume, and this is called the Tamagawa number of the group. So it's a theorem in uh, characteristic zero for number fields by uh, Langlands, Lai, and Kotwitz that uh, this volume is always equal to 1. Uh, this um, uh, Langlands proved uh, this was in the Boulder Conference, 1966, I believe, uh, that he did the case for split groups. Um, uh, for groups over the rational numbers, if your field F is just the rational numbers, uh, the proof comes down to calculating the volume of the group with uh, coefficients in the real numbers modulo the group with uh, coefficients in the integers. Uh, this volume, uh, as calculated by Langlands, is given as a product of Riemann zeta functions evaluated at special values. And uh, what you do is you take uh, the Riemann zeta function has an Euler product expansion. You take that Euler product uh, over the prime p, 
And the Euler factor at each prime p is exactly equal to the piatic volume, and the, uh, or the reciprocal of the piatic volume. And then you multiply them all together, and you get the Riemann zeta function times the inverse of the Riemann zeta functions, and you get exactly one for this product. Uh, so this was calculation done by uh, Langlands. Uh, then uh, Lai generalized this in uh, 1980, I believe, to quasi-split groups using similar techniques. And then the uh, question was, how do you do this uh, in general when the group is not uh, quasi-split? And uh, Kotwitz used the trace formula actually to give the proof in the, the general case. So if I back up just a couple of slides, um, if we look at the uh, Selberg trace formula, we see here that we get a volume uh, coming up in front of the orbital integral. And so the idea is, uh, and, and when we do this with the Arthur Selberg trace formula, and we put gamma equal to the identity element of the group, then what we get is the volume of the group of the Adels modulo the group with coefficients in the number field, and we've got that volume, and that's the thing that we're trying to compute for the Tamagawa number, and then that's multiplied by the orbital integral. That orbital integral for the identity element is just the, uh, well, the centralizer is the whole group, and so we're just evaluating uh, at the identity. And so we see that in the trace formula, we get this Tamagawa number. And if so we could somehow isolate this uh, in the formula, we would get a formula for the Tamagawa number that we might use to prove the conjecture. So that's uh, the basic uh, strategy. Uh, so actually, the way it's done is not with just a single group. But uh, if we take an arbitrary, uh, semi-simple, simply connected group, it has a quasi-split in our form. And by this earlier work by Lie, we already know what its volume is. So we don't have to calculate the volume of uh, this from scratch. It's enough to be able to compare the two volumes to each other and show that they're equal to each other, because we know that one of them is one, and then we get that they're both equal to one. So that's, that's the strategy. And so we want to take the two different trace formulas for the two groups. And this is a, a common theme in the use of trace formulas, that you don't use a, a trace formula in isolation, but you combine two or more different trace formulas and use them to subtract off terms that you don't want. And then you get nice uh, formulas comparing uh, representations on two groups, or uh, in this case, uh, volumes on two groups as a result. Uh, so that's the general strategy. You write down the group. You write down the quasi-split inner form of the group. You subtract the two trace formulas from each other. And then uh, we have an arbitrary test function, f, that we're able to plug in to this group. And so Kotwitz uh, makes a very clever choice of uh, function to, go, to put into this formula called the Euler-Poincaré uh, functions that cancel out all of the terms on the geometric side except for the term corresponding to the identity element. And so you've isolated on the geometric side of the trace formula the single term. Uh, and then you still have the spectral term that's on the, the other side of the trace formula to, to deal with. Uh, but here, uh, let me just uh, copy this uh, formula up on the next page. Uh, we still have the spectral side of the trace formula. Uh, but there's a general <laughs> argument that Kotwitz is able to use to show that these terms all have to vanish uh, from the fact that you're taking a trace formula over the Adels, you get a sum that's uh, a discrete sum over representations. But looking at this, uh, uh, the Adels, they're, they're a product over all the different completions. If you fix one completion and you look at this formula for the identity element, locally, you see that it has to be a continuous sum over representations. But from the trace formula, it's a discrete sum over representations. And using these two conflicting descriptions of the spectral side, you see that the spectral side has to vanish. And so what you're left with is a trace formula that just has a single term, 
uh, that has uh, the difference of the two volumes. And you can pick this f to be non-zero. And so you see that the uh, two volumes have to be equal. So this is the type of thing that you can do with a trace formula. OK, so now I'm going to uh, change topics a little bit and talk about uh, lo local Langlands conjecture for the uh, general linear group. Uh, this is uh, uh, this was a conjecture for many years, that eventually uh, approved by Harris and Taylor, and now uh, there are other proofs by NER and Schultze. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, briefly review this theorem. So I'm going to uh, so until now F has been uh, a number field, but I'm going to shift notation so that F is now going to be uh, a completion of a number field, so, and one of the non-Archimedean completions. So it's going to be a non-Archimedean local field of characteristic zero. And I'm going to write uh, K sub F for the residue field. Um, so if I take the algebraic closure of the field, I can take its Galois group, and uh, they defined a subgroup of, well, as an abstract group, the Vey group is a, just a subgroup of this Galois group. Uh, and it, as an abstract group, it's defined to be uh, the, the elements in the Galois group uh, uh, give automorphisms of the integers of the, the field. And then by reduction to the residue field, they give uh, automorphisms of the, the algebraic closure of the finite field. So there's a homomorphism from the Galois group of uh, the Piatic field, the non-Archimedean field, into the Galois group of, uh, over the finite field. And uh, over the finite field, there's a canonical uh, topological generator, uh, the Frobenius map that just uh, raises elements to the qth power. And if I take the subgroup consisting of elements that act uh, on the residue field by just a finite power of the Frobenius map, uh, I get an abstract group called the Vey group. And then actually we need to put a slightly different uh, topology on it. So it's not just the topology it gets by the subgroup, but we want to make uh, the kernel of this map to be an open uh, subgroup rather than uh, um, just what it gets by you know, sitting inside the Galois group. So this is the Ve group. And then uh, L sub F, I'll call this the Langlands, local Langlands uh, group is just the product of this Ve group with uh, SU2, the group of two by two unitary matrices. And then I'll take all equivalence classes of semi-simple continuous representations of this Gawa group type thing into the general linear group. Uh, n by n matrices with coefficients in C. And then on the other side, I'm going to take all of the equivalence classes of irreducible admissible representations of the group of general linear matrices, n by n, with coefficients in the piatic field. So in general, these will be infinite dimensional representations of this piatic uh, group over the piatic field. And uh, this phi, these are going to be finite dimensional representations. And the theorem is that there's a canonical bijection between these two sets, one giving finite dimensional representations of a Galois group type thing, and the other giving infinite dimensional representations of a group over a pianic field. So this is the theorem. Uh, for each n, there exists a unique bijection uh, between the Galois group side and the representation theory side. Uh, in the case of n equals 1, uh, let me just uh, back up and we'll look at what happens with n equals 1. Um, well, we're looking at uh, this group LF. SU2 doesn't have any non-trivial one-by-one one representation. So we can just throw away that factor for the one-by-one one case. And then the Ve group, we're taking one-dimensional representations of that. So it will have to factor through the commutator, because uh, the GL1 is uh, abelian, and it will factor through the closed commutator, because we're taking it to be continuous. And so we're lo just looking at the maximal abelian quotient of this Ve group. 
And by local class field theory, that's just the multiplicative group of the field. And then on the other side, we're taking GL1. And GL1 is also the multiplicative group of the field. And so by class field, local class field theory, it's just a tautology that we're looking on both sides with the multiplicative group of the field. And so it's just uh, uh, the representations equal the representations in the case of GL1. Uh, so uh, that's the first property. In the case of uh, GL1, it's just uh, the identity that you get by local class field theory. And then uh, it becomes, this bijection becomes unique if you specify certain properties that I won't describe in detail. Uh, but uh, just compatibilities with determinants and central characters and taking contragradients of these representations. And there are uh, certain local uh, L functions that you can define and epsilon factors. And uh, if you insist on compatibility of all of these, then that uniquely pins down this uh, correspondence. So there's a similar bijection that holds for the uh, irreducible admissible representations of GLN, uh, say, over the real numbers. Um, and if we then ask for the general conjecture, that's saying there should be some sort of correspondence like this now between rep finite dimensional representations of Galois groups on one side corresponding with infinite dimensional admissible representations of uh, p-adic non-Archimedean uh, groups over these uh, non-Archimedean fields. So now let me uh, talk about a similar theorem now, not for GLN. GLN's the easiest case of this, but uh, now for the symplectic group of uh, uh, so Arthur has uh, uh, results on the local Langlands correspondence for classical groups, symplectic and orthogonal groups, assuming uh, forthcoming work of uh, Valsberger on the stabilization of the twisted trace formula. More about that later. Um, but uh, uh, I'll just describe his uh, result in the special case of the uh, symplectic group of rank N. So let phi, I'm going to let this denote the equivalence classes of semi-simple continuous representations. LF is the same group as before, just the product of this uh, Galois group type thing, the, the Vey group with SU2, into, um, uh, I'm sorry, I've, I've written, I've got a typo here. I've, I've written SL here. These should be representations into the special orthogonal group SO2N plus one, uh, whose image is relatively compact. And then uh, whenever I have such a representation, I can take the image of that representation to get a subgroup, and then I can take the, the centralizer of that subgroup, and then take, uh, that in general will not be a connected group, and then I can take the group of connected components of that, and I'll get just a, a finite abelian group as that uh, group of components. And then, uh, so that's going to be what I have on one side. And then on the other side, I'm going to take the set of equivalence classes of irreducible tempered representations of this symplectic group. And then the uh, local Langlands correspondence in this case is a similar theorem uh, that Arthur has uh, a correspondence between the representations, uh, the tempered representations on one side, and these representations of the Langlands group on the other side. And what he gets is an injective map from the tempered representations into uh, ordered pairs where phi is one of these uh, bounded uh, representations, and A is something in the dual of this component group. So just a finite abelian group here. And uh, he characterizes, again, uh, this map is uniquely characterized by a set of identities he obtains uh, between uh, the symplectic group and twisted characters of GLN. I'll say more about twisted in just a moment. Um, 
so uh, this is so Arthur has a book uh, that was published last year about this. This is one of the main three theorems in that book. Uh, the theorem is more general than what I've stated here because it also includes uh, uh, the orthogonal groups. Um, and uh, the other two main theorems are global in nature, talking about the uh, spectral decomposition of uh, this L2 space that I uh, showed in an earlier slide. Um, so I used the word twisted in um, the previous slide. Uh, in general, twisted just means that we throw in an automorphism into the group. So if I have a, a reductive group or, uh, and some automorphism and uh, maybe a quasi-character of the group, uh, there's a way of throwing that uh, automorphism into the orbital integral. So that instead of taking the conjugacy class, I take what is called the twisted conjugacy class, or instead of taking G inverse gamma G, I take G inverse gamma theta G. So this is uh, the twisted conjugacy class. Instead of just integrating over the group or the group mod the centralizer, I'm also throwing this quasi-character. And the quasi-character doesn't play much of a role, but the automorphisms play a really crucial role in this theory of Arthur. Um, and so these uh, automorphisms can just be inserted everywhere. So you put it in uh, the spectral side of the trace formula, the geometric side of the trace formula, and so everything is twisted everywhere. And so instead of having a trace formula, you have a twisted trace formula where there's an automorphism everywhere you go. Um, so the main tool in Arthur's book, and it gets used in the proof of this uh, particular theorem, is a stable twisted trace formula. Um, and again, like I said, often with trace formulas, you don't use them in isolation, but you, use, uh, you pair up different trace formulas and cancel off terms between them. And what he uses is a twisted trace formula for GLN. So GLN has uh, an outer automorphism transpose inverse. And uh, he also uses a standard trace formula for the symplectic group. And the idea is, uh, so if, if you go through his whole book, he actually uses lots of trace formulas. He uses lots of twisted trace formulas and so forth. Um, but the most relevant piece is relating the symplectic group to the twisting of GLN. So let me just give a very, very, very rough strategy of a 600-page book. Um, okay, so this, this is one slide summarizing 600 pages. But um, each representation... Uh, we're going into SON, correcting that typo I had in the earlier slide. And then that SON, 2N plus 1, is a subgroup of GL, 2N plus 1. And by Harrison-Taylor now, we get, this is something that we know about from uh, this uh, result for the local Langlands for GLN. So we know how to attach an infinite dimensional representation to this uh, representation. So I get something, uh, a representation in GLN 2N plus 1. But that's in the wrong group, right? I want to go back to the symplectic group. So what I want to do is compare the spectral size of the trace formula for the twisted GLN, because that's where I have the representation, and the symplectic group uh, SP2N. And so then you just write down the twisted trace formula uh, for GLN, the uh, ordinary trace formula for the symplectic group. You subtract one from the other. And then the idea is you want to get spectral information, right? We want to relate the representations on these two different groups. So if we could cancel out everything on the left, then we would be well on our way to getting information relating the spectral side. So what we want are identities between orbital integrals on the left-hand side. And this is a preview of tomorrow's talk because the fundamental lemma that I'll be talking about is all about uh, using uh, geometry, geometric representation theory, to uh, prove different identities that come up on the left-hand side. 
to, ultimately, you want everything to cancel on the left-hand side by proving identities of we've got a distribution, uh, we've got a test function f that we can choose, and a test function f prime that we can choose. So if we choose these suitably, uh, we can try to make these the left-hand side cancel without uh, throwing away too much information on the right-hand side. Okay, so that's uh, just very quickly the, the uh, strategy. Um, so here's the unabridged version. Uh, so uh, Arthur's book, uh, Endoscopic Classification of Representations, Orthogonal and Symplectic Groups, 590 pages, 2013. It makes use of the forthcoming papers of Valsberger. Valsberger has posted the first six of these papers on the archive. Uh, you see that they're all, except for uh, this one of 35 pages, <laughs> They're all somewhere around 100 pages each. Uh, I understand there are going to be something like four more papers before the project is complete. Uh, so uh, if you just sort of look at the titles, uh, you can sort of guess what's coming in the final papers because you just match the titles of, against uh, you know, the terms in the trace formula, and there should be. <laughs> At least one paper for every piece of the trace formula. So there's there's nothing in the no, none of the titles talk about the spectral side of the, the stable twisted trace formula. So we, we expect that in the uh, in the forthcoming uh, papers. Uh, so if you count all these pages up, you get something like uh, 1,200 pages so far on this project. So there's a a wiki list of long proofs that has about 20 entries. You can go look it up. But this is a digression, but um, <laughs> you see that representation theory has more than its share <laughs> of wiki uh, entries on this list. Uh, starting with Killing's classification of complex simple Lie algebras, the original proof of this was 180 pages. So this made the list. Uh, Chandra's work on the discrete series makes the list. Eisenstein's uh, work on uh, the functional equation satisfied by Eisenstein's series makes the list. Uh, Hedgehall's book on the Selberg trace formula makes the list. Uh, Arthur, uh, so the wiki doesn't give the years or the number of pages. It just says that the number of pages over a number of years. This isn't including this book, so his book is on top of this. Um, or Laforgue's uh, proof of uh, Langland's conjecture for GLN over function fields, uh, another 600 pages. So um, between us and the classification of finite simple groups, uh, we have a large part of this list covered. Uh, okay, so in the final minute, so I'll give a bit of a preview of, of what's coming up. Note that Arthur relates on one side the irreducible tempered representations of a symplectic group with the finite dimensional homomorphisms of this local Langlands group into the special orthogonal group. Now, this might seem surprising at first that, uh, you know, like, why shouldn't it be the symplectic on both sides or the orthogonal on both sides? On one side, we're taking representations of the symplectic group. On the other side, we're taking representations of the orthogonal group. And this is how it has to be for the theory to work out. So this is an example of a general duality uh, that each uh, reductive group G over a local field has a complex dual reductive group that somehow controls the representation theory of that group. And a big part of the Langlands program is then to relate the representation theory of two reductive groups whenever their dual groups are related to one another. Um, so just as by way of analogy, if we have a finite dimensional vector space and I take a HOM, uh, so just uh, linear maps from V into C, we get uh, one dimensional representations of this vector space. So I can think of I mean, we have this general notion of duality, a vector space, a dual vector space, or Pontryagin dual. And uh, in the case of reductive groups, the Langlands dual is the appropriate notion of duality between two groups uh, 
And the way to state this precisely is that if I have a group, uh, if I take it over the algebraic closure, so it's a split group, this reductive group is classified by a four-tuple, uh, the group of all the characters on the group, all the co-characters, all the roots and the co-roots. And if I just uh, exchange characters and co-characters, roots and co-roots, that gives a duality. And that is uh, how this duality is defined. And if you look at this carefully, you see that this duality exchanges, if you look at the Dinkin diagram, it exchanges the short and the long roots, for instance. So it changes the direction of the arrow in the Dinkin diagram. So BN becomes type CN, and CN becomes type BN. And this is explaining why the symplectic and the orthogonal group are related in this theorem of Arthur. Uh, and so it has a bunch of different properties. For instance, if you have a group with uh, uh, connected center, then it's, um, you get a dual whose uh, derived group is simply connected. And then there's a more refined version of this duality that takes uh, a semi-direct product of this group with a Galois group or a, a V group. Uh, the, the notation here is a little bit loose. People uh, use the same notation. The L, this is called the L group with the L on the, on the left, uh, superscript. Uh, sometimes people use the V group, sometimes people use the Gawa group. But uh, you get, uh, if you have a quasi-split group, say, uh, you get an action of the Gawa group on this data that classifies the, uh, the reductive group. And uh, you take the action that permutes the set of uh, positive simple roots and uh, using that action, then you obviously have uh, an action on the dual data because it's really just the same data, just reordered. And so, uh, and then you can use that to obtain uh, an action of the Gawa group that's now an algebraic action on this complex group, and you take the, the semi direct product. So, I'll just give uh, an example. Uh, if you have the unitary group, uh, it splits over a quadratic extension. Uh, so over this quadratic extension, G becomes isomorphic to the general linear group. And so the, the connected part of the dual group is GLNC. Um, but then we can take the transpose inverse outer, outer automorphism of G, and uh, we let the Gawa group act through its, uh, so it has this quotient. We have this quadratic extension. So we get a Galois group of order two. This automorphism has order two, so we can identify those two groups. And then I can have the uh, Galois group act as automorphisms of this complex group through this uh, transpose inverse automorphism. And then I can take a semi-direct product. Okay, so um, I'll, uh, maybe I'll uh, make this my last slide today. Uh, tomorrow, as I said, we'll now move much more into the geometry. Uh, uh, Ngo Bao Cho gave a very beautiful interpretation of the geometric side of the trace formula in terms of the Hitchin vibration. So uh, I've talked about things analytically today, but this can all be uh, interpreted geometrically, uh, and we'll uh, turn to some of that tomorrow. Thank you. Mm -hmm.